a medication that can grow hair where you want it, stop hair growth where you don't want it, and get rid of acne? That's right. It's called spironolactone, and it exists. I'm Blake Brooks. I'm a board-certified dermatologist and hair specialist, and on this channel, I talk about all things hair with some things skin and beauty thrown in, too. If that sounds like content you're interested in, please like this video, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any new content. I put out videos on a regular basis, so if you want to learn about something, just let me know. Today, we're going to talk about a medication called spironolactone. It is one of my favorite medications in all of dermatology because it has helped so many of my patients. It can be used for a really large number of conditions with really good effect. To give you a roadmap for the video today, first, I'm going to talk to you about the medication, how it works. Then I'm going to talk about the conditions it can be used to treat. All of these, by the way, are considered off-label uses of the medication, though they're really, really frequently used by dermatologists for these conditions. I'm also going to talk a bit in depth about a condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome, or PCOS. These patients experience a number of symptoms that can all be addressed by spironolactone, so they tend to be really good candidates. At the end, I'm going to delve in side effects, who's a good versus bad candidate for the medication and monitoring, so stick around because there are some important things to talk to your doctor about before starting. And just a quick heads up, when used for hair and acne, spironolactone is used in female patients only. Okay, let's jump in. This medication has been such a game changer for so many of my patients, so I love it so much. I feel like this is the case for many of our medications we use in dermatology, but spironolactone is actually a blood pressure medication in its original use, and it's actually still used as a blood pressure medication and falls under the category of diuretic or water pill, meaning it lowers your blood pressure by making you pee. It was approved in the 60s, so it's been around for a long time, which is great because the longer the medication is around, the more we know about its long-term safety and side effects. We use it off-label for a bunch of conditions in dermatology, which I'll talk about in a bit, but the way that it works for those conditions is it blocks androgen receptors or male hormone receptors. Essentially, if a male hormone receptor is sitting there and waiting to be activated by testosterone, for instance, spironolactone goes in and takes up shop at the receptor site, preventing the testosterone from getting there. Just because we're using it to block male hormones doesn't mean that we don't also experience the other effects that are related to its ability to lower blood pressure, so that's important to keep in mind as we go forward. In terms of the nitty gritty of how it works for blood pressure, the main thing to know is that as a result of how it works, it makes you hold on to potassium. That will become more relevant later when I talk about side effects and monitoring, but we'll put a pin in it for now. Let's talk about all of the conditions spironolactone can magically simultaneously treat. We'll start with PCOS. I think an important first condition to talk about is called polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS. PCOS is an extremely common condition. In fact, it's the most common endocrine disorder in women of reproductive age worldwide. Endocrine disorders are at a really high level, those that affect hormones, which PCOS does. And in terms of just how common it is, about five to 15% of women worldwide have PCOS. The range is there because there's some variability in the criteria people use to diagnose it. If you're wondering if you have PCOS, the most common criteria used is called the Rotterdam criteria. And essentially, for you to meet a diagnosis of PCOS, you need at least two of the three of the following. The first criteria is chronic anovulation. That basically means that you're not ovulating or dropping an egg every month. And the way you can do a quick check for this is to think about your periods. Are they really irregular? Are they irregular in the sense that you're skipping periods or there's a longer time between periods? That could mean you're not ovulating. It can be helpful when evaluating to know that if you start to have significant period irregularity after age 30, it's less likely to be the result of PCOS as PCOS generally causes period irregularity earlier on, think like in the teenage years. The second criteria is hyperandrogenism or excess male hormones. This can be clinical or biological, meaning you can show signs of this on exam with things like acne, pattern hair loss, unwanted hair growth on your chin, belly, breasts, or you can get lab tests that show that you have elevated androgens. The third criteria is polycystic ovaries, and that's something that is usually evaluated in a doctor's office with uh, an ultrasound. To be diagnosed, you also shouldn't have other reasons to be experiencing these things, like genetic diseases that cause chronic elevations in cortisol, for instance. 
And in line with that, PCOS is generally not something that comes on in a flash. So immediate onset of these things with quick progression when you previously had nothing like it would warrant additional studies. PCOS can cluster or run with other conditions like metabolic syndrome with many women with PCOS struggling with weight, cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. And PCOS can also cause difficulty with pregnancy related to the anovulation, so not ovulating on a monthly basis. While the gold standard treatment for PCOS is a combined oral contraceptive, meaning a birth control pill that has both estrogen and progesterone, which can help to regulate cycles and is considered first line treatment for unwanted hair growth in this population, antiandrogens like spironolactone play a really important role in improving upon results and are excellent for the other features of PCOS like acne and pattern hair loss, which I'll discuss shortly. If you think you have PCOS, I would see your ob gyne your primary care or dermatologist as a first step, and they might discuss spironolactone with you, at which point you can tell them you know all about it after watching this video. <laughs> the next conditions to discuss would be hair loss and unwanted hair growth. Let's talk about hair loss in places where you wanna keep your hair, like your scalp, and hair growth in places you don't wanna have it, like your face. When talking about hair, spironolactone blocks DHT from binding androgen receptors. Watch my videos on finasteride and male pattern hair loss to better understand the importance of DHT. But in brief, DHT or dihydrotestosterone is a male hormone that is considered the bad player in hair loss. Its presence and activity in the hair follicles is what largely accounts for hair loss and hair changes in male pattern hair loss. While we don't understand the exact hormones at play in female pattern hair loss, our medications that block DHT work and work well, so it's definitely a big contributing factor. Where DHT and male hormones in general can kind of make your head spin is that they work differently in different places. So on the scalp, its activity is a no-no in that it can make hair get finer and finer over time. That's called miniaturization and is one of the hallmarks of pattern hair loss with eventual loss of the hairs whereas on the face, it makes hair grow. So for my female patients out there, here's the significance. Blocking male hormones makes hair grow on your head and stops hair in places you don't wanna have it, again, like your face. In terms of the evidence for hair loss, it's not perfect in that not every patient seems to respond to spironolactone, but a paper that was recently published by a group out of Harvard looked at a group of pre and post menopausal female patients. The patients received an average dose of 100 milligrams of spironolactone. That's actually typically what I start my patients at, although recent data suggests even lower doses might be effective for hair loss. They saw that all patients maintained or improved hair density at six months, meaning that patients either improved or there was no progression of female pattern hair loss, which is a win because pattern hair loss is a progressive process. Interestingly, patients with more progressive hair loss actually saw greater gains. And also kind of important, progress at one year was significantly better than at six months in studies. And there's another medication that's frequently used for hair loss in women called minoxidil. It's also known as Rogaine, which can be taken by mouth or applied topically to the scalp. Minoxidil is also a blood pressure medication. So sometimes doctors hesitate to put both of these on board simultaneously in case there's a negative effect. But a recent small study showed no worsening of side effects with combination therapy. And another study actually suggested that combination therapy can improve minoxidil side effects. I'll put another video out on minoxidil in the future, but that was just a quick aside in case you're looking into a possible combination regimen and are wondering if that's a reasonable approach to discuss with your doctor. The data and recommendations for unwanted hair growth, again, suggest a combination oral contraceptive pills. So a birth control pill that has both estrogen and progesterone would be first line, but the data does show improvement in unwanted hair growth in women with and without PCOS with spironolactone. So the gold standard recommendation, start with an oral contraceptive pill and add in spironolactone if the results are suboptimal or start with spironolactone if combined oral contraceptive pills can't be used. And that's really the case for a lot of my patients. So spironolactone can really shine here. The next condition to discuss is acne. Acne is incredibly common. About 85% of adolescents experience it, and it does not end in adolescence. For many, many adults, acne is a frequent problem, and I see a lot of patients for it. We sometimes classify acne as hormonal acne, and we do this when our patients tell us that their acne fluctuates with their menstrual cycle and when their acne is largely along the chin and jawline. Hormonal acne basically means acne that's influenced by hormone levels in the body, or notably androgens, what spironolactone blocks. 
Hormones increase oil production and worsen inflammation, so are part of the reason why acne occurs and worsens. As a pill that blocks male hormones that cause acne to worsen, spironolactone is something I often pull for. And while I think we classically think of spironolactone as being helpful in women with a textbook picture of hormonal acne, meaning acne on the chin and jaw that flares with your periods, it really works well for acne in general. In fact, a study looking at long-term use of spironolactone showed 75% of women had reduction or complete clearance of facial acne at their very first follow-up, with more than 80% showing reduction or complete clearance of their acne on their chest and back. Full effect took around six months after initiation, so it does take time. And not all patients completed the full study, but of those who did, 96% were clear at greater than two years after spironolactone start. A maximum dose of about 200 milligrams can be used in acne, and the study I just mentioned, an initial dose of 100 to 150 milligrams daily was recommended, given that it does take time to see results. But just a side note here, patients with PCOS often require higher doses to see improvement. The last condition to discuss is something called hydratinitis suppurativa, or HS. Spironolactone is an incredibly effective treatment for certain patients with hydratinitis suppurativa, or HS. Hydratinitis suppurativa is a very painful chronic condition where patients get inflamed lumps in their armpits, buttocks, groin, and under their breasts or panis. It's notoriously difficult to treat, and of all the conditions affecting the skin, it has one of the greatest impacts on quality of life. So the U.S. and Canadian Hydratinitis Suppurativa Foundations released clinical management guidelines a few years ago, and they actually highlighted spironolactone as a treatment option for HS. HS disease activity is influenced by hormones, which is why we see changes in disease activity with pregnancy and menstruation. Birth control pills for that reason can be used, and there are particular birth control pills that are favored and some that aren't, but spironolactone can also be used with a birth control pill or alone. And there's not a huge amount of data to pull from, but there was a small study and they treated patients with 100 to 150 milligrams of spironolactone a day. It led to improvement in 85% of women and 55% had complete remission. HS is so tough to treat, so those numbers are actually really great. And in my patients with HS who note that their disease flares with their periods or they have features consistent with PCOS, even if they don't carry a formal diagnosis, I'm much more likely to pull for spironolactone. I do think it's worth mentioning that right before these guidelines were released, a separate paper on spironolactone use in HS showed that patients benefited even with lower doses of spironolactone, as low as 25 milligrams. So higher doses might not be needed, and it's an important thing to think about if you're having a hard time tolerating a higher dose of the medication. When I talk to my patients about side effects, I often divide them into two broad categories side effects related to blood pressure lowering effects and side effects related to androgen or male hormone blocking effects. In theory, because spironolactone is a diuretic or a water pill, it could lower people's blood pressure to the point that they enter into a low blood pressure state, so to speak. If that happened, you could start to see persistent dizziness, lightheadedness, feelings of low energy. But interestingly, a small study out of NYU looked at this and they saw that there was no significant difference in blood pressure regardless of dose of spironolactone. There was a larger study looking at spironolactone use in acne, and they did find an effect. They said there was a decrease in blood pressure of about 3.5 millimeters of mercury. So essentially moving you from 120 over 80 to 116.5 over 80, nothing really big there. I usually tell my patients it's really great at helping with hair loss and acne, not so great at lowering your blood pressure because most of my patients tolerate it really well from that perspective. I do tell my patients to take it with a large glass of water because it makes you pee. Again, that's how it lowers your blood pressure. So that's another side effect that might be noted. And I also tell my patients to hold on eating super large quantities of potassium containing foods and drinks. Think things like bananas, avocados, coconut water, as the medication causes you to hold on to potassium and it can cause electrolyte abnormalities in a small population. There are certain times when patients might require blood work monitoring because of the medication's effect on potassium. And I'll go into that shortly. Those are the side effects related to spironolactone's effect on blood pressure and how it works as a blood pressure medication. The other side effects, remember, relate to how it affects androgens and male hormones. And this is kind of the you can't have your cake and eat it too of spironolactone. We want to block the male hormones. That's how it works so well for hair loss, unwanted hair growth, acne, and HS. But it's not without associated side effects. Patients can have menstrual irregularities with breakthrough bleeding commonly cited. In fact, 
I've had patients think their IUD is failing because they develop breakthrough bleeding when started on spironolactone. So if you experience this, it's a pretty high possibility it's the spironolactone causing it. And this does tend to be dose dependent. So if it's becoming a large issue, talk to your doctor about potentially lowering the dose that could improve things. Or you could talk to your doctor about adding a birth control pill in to help with your period regulation. Spironolactone is also considered a teratogen, meaning it can cause problems with normal fetal development if taken by a pregnant woman. The reason for this is because spironolactone blocks male hormones, right? So if you have a male baby developing, it could stop normal development and cause what's called feminization, which has been seen in animal studies. There, interestingly, are a small number of reports of women who remained on spironolactone during pregnancy. They were on it because of kidney disease, and that's something that spironolactone can be used for. There was no feminization noted in their kids related to the medication. However, that's not robust data. Right? So we really have to assume it causes issues with developing babies. So pregnancy with spironolactone is considered a big no. I always tell my patients that while I don't want them to become pregnant while on the medication, they can always stop the medication with a washout period before trying to become pregnant as the medication will not prevent normal, healthy, wonderful pregnancies in the future. Spironolactone carries an FDA warning suggesting possible increased risk of cancer based on animal studies only. The theoretical risk is related to the fact that in blocking male hormones, there might be an increase in certain hormonally regulated cancers like breast and gynecologic cancers. In the animal studies that prompted the FDA warning, animals were given doses as high as 150 times the greatest doses used in humans, which led to development of breast cancer, testicular cancer, and liver cancer. Many studies in humans have refuted this, and a recent study looking at available data in humans found no increased risk of cancer, including breast and ovarian cancer, with actually a decreased risk of prostate cancer. The level of evidence was considered low, meaning that we can't make any definitive statements here, but more and more evidence is continually coming out suggesting safety. In fact, another study just came out in 2024 that showed no evidence of increased tumor risk. The evidence continues to argue against a risk for breast cancer and gynecologic cancers, and there's even data looking at its use in breast cancer survivors with no increased risk in breast cancer seen. That being said, if you carry a personal history of breast cancer or if you have a strong family history, it's always a good idea to talk to your doctor and understand the risks and the benefits to know if it's the right medication for you. So who is a good versus bad candidate for spironolactone? When I think about a good candidate for spironolactone or a possible good candidate, it's a female patient who has any of the conditions that we talked about today. Bad candidates would be people with very low blood pressure because this could in theory lower your blood pressure further. Those with a history of high potassium or hyperkalemia because the medication makes you hold on to potassium. Those with kidney injury, either acute or severe because the kidneys are needed to remove the extra potassium from your body. And patients who are pregnant or trying to become pregnant or patients who are breastfeeding because spironolactone does pass into the breast milk. The lab test we sometimes monitor in patients on spironolactone is potassium, and that's specifically because we know that spironolactone makes your body hold on to potassium. For many patients taking spironolactone, no lab monitoring is necessary. Studies have shown that in patients who are healthy and under the age of 45, elevations in potassium are really not significant and their bodies kind of just get rid of that extra potassium. But there are times when we might still monitor potassium levels, even in younger patients. And that's specifically if you have certain medical conditions or are on certain medications that also increase your potassium levels. So make sure that you speak with your doctor about any medical history and any medications you are currently taking. In patients over 45, we do generally monitor potassium levels before and after initiation, as well as dose increases based on the data. That's an in-depth look at spironolactone, one of my favorite medications in all of dermatology, and hopefully that helped to clear up some of your questions. If you have any additional questions, leave them below and I'll do my best to help out. Also, if you're on spironolactone, let me know how things are going. I'll love to hear about it.